I'd like to sort of pick up where Philip left off and to give a little bit more details about the elimination program uh, that, that's currently going on. And this is work that I've been involved with with the World Health Organization, TDR, which is Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases. And uh, TDR has really played a major role in, in um, stewarding the, the elimination program in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. So I'll just give a little bit of details about how some of this work has gone on over the last few years. So first of all, if you want to eliminate a disease, you have to have certain considerations first. You just can't walk in there and say, I want to eliminate the disease. You have to consider some, some things. First of all, you need to have a target, an elimination target. And the WHO elimination target is often one case in 10,000. So clearly, the disease is still there. But it's being eliminated has a major public health problem. Okay? It's, it's not, no longer a major public health problem. But you still will have cases. And that, that, that's one uh, caveat, maybe one weakness of the program. Um, there should be a human reservoir. It's very difficult to eliminate cutaneous leishmaniasis with the, with the animal reservoir. So you, know, it's, you, you pretty much can't do it. But VL with the human reservoir, that's something you can think about. So if you have a human reservoir, you can start to think about elimination. You, act, you have to have certain tools available, of course. Uh, you need to have effective diagnostics, effective treatments, and that's really been a huge improvement over the last 10 years. And vector control mechanisms. And in the case of leishmaniasis, there is effective vector control as well. Surveillance is key. You have to know where the disease is. You have to know where the cases are. You have to be able to identify them as soon as possible. So this is often a difficult aspect, especially when you have a very large population, such as in, the, in, uh, in Bihar in India. And one other thing, the disease you want to eliminate has to make people very sick. So the disease, so we want to eliminate visceral leishmaniasis. If you have visceral leishmaniasis, you're very ill. You know someone has a disease, they really are suffering, and if you don't get treated, they'll die. So you can eliminate visceral leishmaniasis because you can identify them, they're very sick people. Uh, asymptomatic infection is very difficult to get rid of because people are, are, are well, they have the parasite, but they're not they don't have any clinical form. So it's very difficult to go after a disease that has no clinical uh, epidemiology. So VL does have, a, have a, a, a distinct clinical presentation, so that's something that could be considered for elimination. So visceral leishmaniasis largely fits into this pretty well, so this makes it reasonable to start thinking about how you can go about doing this now. Uh, of course, this is the life cycle everybody knows. I won't go into details. I just wanted to, to uh, reiterate the fact that if the reservoir are, is animal reservoir, particularly rodents, forget it. Don't try to do an elimination program. Maybe with the dogs you can. Dogs are sort of um, you know, uh, domestic animals, so if, if, if the dog is a reservoir, you can. But it's a real problem what's happening in Spain now because uh, hares, the rabbits, are the reservoir. So that'll be a problem uh, in Spain. So really, you have to think about reservoir where humans are the reservoir. And that's visceral leishmaniasis, where humans are the main reservoir. Of course, uh, the life cycle you all know is here. So the program initiated uh, when I joined it, it was in 2009. Uh, and at that time, uh, and, and, and this is some overlap with, with, with Philippe, the, the real focus of visceral leishmaniasis was in this part of the world, which is quite remarkable. If you, you think of India as such a large country, uh, to have virtually all of the cases of, of visceral leishmaniasis just located in the northern part of Bihar, and then, of course, the southern part of Nepal and Bangladesh as well. So this is a real advantage to have so much disease focus in one area so you don't have to be working in this area. You don't have to be working outside. You can really focus your energy. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're successful here, you can get rid of 60% of the cases on a worldwide basis. So this really makes a lot of uh, sense for the WHO at the time to start to move in here and see what, what can be done to do the elimination. So this is a typical village in Bihar. Some of you from India, of course, know, know this very well. But this is the, um, the northern part of, uh, of India, just south of the, of the Nepal border. Um, 
And uh, it's really a very beautiful part of India. I enjoy it very much. It's very green, and it's, it's an interesting part, very interesting. It has a lot of amazing history. The people are quite, quite remarkable as well. It, it, it's a real remarkable part of the world, and I enjoy going there uh, a lot. One of the major challenges, though, is if you can imagine a population of 90 million people in one state. So this is that area here. So that's three, the population of maybe twice the population of Italy in one small part of India. So, that, so it, it's a scale problem. It's just how do you deal with such a large number of people? How do, you, how do you work on an elimination program with so many people? And I think that's really the major, major um, challenge is this, the, the, the issue is scale. How do you deal with such a large population? How do you implement a program that's going to reach that number of people? So that's where really the challenge, uh, the challenge is. And, and I'll talk about some of the strategies we have uh, to meet that challenge. This again is Bihar. This is the rainy season during the monsoon and of course you can see um, it's very wet there for three months of the year and this is very good for the sand flies. Uh, you know, that like to breed in these areas. There's a lot of warmth, there's a lot of moisture, a lot of humidity. It's a perfect area for, uh, for, for breeding of sand flies. Um, so that's one of the major, that's again one of the major uh, challenges in this area. So uh, again, uh, these are some of the epidemiologic features that make it possible to go for this target of one in 10,000. Humans are the only reservoir. There's only one vector species and you can there is uh, uh, effective uh, vector control mechanisms. The distribution is very limited, highly clustered. And, and, and some of the recent advances that have really made a big difference uh, is the ability to diagnose the infection. It's how do you know if someone has the infection? And so there's a very rapid blood test which detects antibodies against the parasite. I'll show it to you in a minute. It's the RK39 test, the lateral flow test. The other thing that's happened over the last over 10 years uh, 10 to 15 years is there are much better drugs. Typically, antimony was used to treat uh, this disease, but uh, there are newer drugs now which are available. Miltifosin is fantastic because it's oral, so somebody can just take it for 28 days, two pills a day. Problem is compliance because 28 days is a long period, but it's, it's, it's really made a huge difference to be able to have an oral drug when somebody comes in and needs treatment, you give them pills and they can walk away back to their village and take the pills. Uh, that's really a, been a fantastic uh, uh, to support the elimination program. And more recently, there's uh, Ambazome, which is also an amazing drug because even though it has to be given through an IV injection in the vein, it's only one treatment. Right now, it's, it's just a single treatment. So somebody can go into a primary health care center or a district hospital and, and have, a, have an IV treatment for one or two hours and, and virtually be cured of the disease. So you can cure somebody within an afternoon. So this is an incredible thing. Not too many diseases you can do that. So if you have these kind of tools available, you can really think about, let's go after this disease, let's, let's try and eliminate it. So, so these are the kind of opportunities that are out there now to be able to diagnose. You can diagnose and treat someone and cure them almost basically in one single day. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. So um, before we started the program, uh, let's say over 10 years ago, somebody would have the disease in the village. So they would have leishmaniasis here and uh, typically they would go to a village quack. The village quack would give them some treatments. Most of the time it wasn't the right treatment. The person would die in the village and transmit the disease to other people and the disease would stay in the village. And that's why we had very large numbers of visceral leishmaniasis uh, cases and deaths 10 to 15 years ago in the villages. Uh, if some people were fortunate, they did go from the village to the district hospital and, or to another hospital and they got treatments here. Uh, and here it was pentavalent antimony. There was very little treatment, let's say 15 years ago, uh, at the primary health care center. So one of the, the, the objectives was to bring treatments closer to the villages so that when people had the disease, they didn't have to go these distances. The other thing is people had to know what to do. If you have the disease in the village, if you don't know what to do, then it doesn't help very much even if you have the treatments here because they're not going to get it. So this was really um, the area that we really started to focus on in this area to make sure that there was drugs available here 
uh, and that people knew what to do when they had the disease. Very si simple. It's not, you don't, it's not necessarily the most innovative technology that's needed, but you just actually have to use the, the tools that are available in a more effective way. And so this is a primary healthcare center. This is in Varshali, which is uh, in, in Bihar. So uh, this is typical. Uh, primary healthcare centers uh, play a very essential role uh, in, these, in these areas. They're close, they're close to the villages. Uh, each district has about 10 or 12 primary health care centers, and they're, not, they're about 5 to 10 kilometers away. Uh, each primary health care center may take care of anywhere, uh, maybe 200, 300 villages. Uh, people could be, go to the primary health care center. And they also play a very important role for maternal health. So they've, they've had an, an important part where when women are pregnant, rather than give birth in the villages where it was very dangerous, they, would, they now go to the primary health care center, and this is where they give birth. So this has been a, a strengthening of this, this in, in uh, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh has been very important. So that's the primary health care center. Um, and so... In the last five years, what's re the, a lot of the treatments now have been available at these primary health care centers, and it's largely because of this slide here, and Philip talked about this uh, as well. Um, this is the diagnostic test that can be done at a primary health care center. I think this picture was taken in, in Bangladesh, but it's similar in, in uh, India and Nepal. And these are all the tests that could be done, and these are the costs. Uh, and if you look at here, this is the RK39 test. This is the test for visceral leishmaniasis. It detects antibodies against the parasite. The cost is free. Okay? And if you look on this side, this is the treatment for visceral leishmaniasis. And this is the new drug which is now available, uh, and it's donated by Gilead. This is the box that it comes in. This is a, the cardboard box. Uh, and you can see on the box it says, this supply is for visceral leishmaniasis in developing countries. And this was a, a, an agreement that the WHO worked out with Gilead so that Gilead would provide the drug for free to these areas. And it's providing it for free in Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, and India. So this now brings diagnosis and treatment closer to the place where the disease is, and it's free. So people should no longer pay money to be treated. Uh, they can actually go there and be treated for free. Being able to be treated for free is also a large incentive rather than being pay, paid to a local quack. If you know you can be, you can be uh, treated for free, it's, it really makes a big difference. Uh, this is the diagnostic test that I was telling you about. It's, it's really wonderful because this test doesn't require any electricity. It doesn't require any electronics. All it requires is a drop of blood, and it's just a, 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 a strip here. You put a drop of blood on it. You add in some few drops of buffer, and it's a sort of chromatography strip, uh, and the solution moves up, including the antibodies, and there's a, an antigen called K39, and if there's antibodies against the antigen, you get a line here showing that you have antibodies against K39, and you have a positive test. That means you've been exposed to the parasite. This test doesn't detect the parasite, but it detects antibodies that you've produced against the parasite. And you can see here is a positive, um, what a positive test would look like. These are all negative here. There's no line here, so this is a negative test. This is produced by InBios. There's other ones available. This one was actually developed by Steve Reed at the Infection De Infectious Disease Research Institute uh, in Seattle. And then it's, it's produced by a company called InBios. Uh, this is a typical diagnostic lab that you would have in, in many of the primary healthcare centers. And you can see you have the table here. It's not, you don't really require a lot of high technology. You have your log book here. This is an RK39 strip test. They also do a sputum test for tuberculosis here. So this would be used for a sputum test. They would look under the microscope. And they also do smears here for malaria as well. So these are the three diseases which can commonly be tested with very relatively low technology uh, um, tests. Now, regarding the ambisome, um, 
it's fine to say, okay, we have the ambisome, it's free, give it to the country and say, now use it. Well, you can't, it doesn't work that way. You actually have to uh, initiate what we call as implementation research to show that the, the drug can be used in the, in the country. So this was work which we, which we did uh, at TDR, WHO, where we started in, in Bangladesh. Actually, we tried to do it in India first. Uh, and India was very reluctant, or India caused, a, w was a lot of pushback from India. So we moved over and we did it in Bangladesh. And it was much easier at the time to work with Bangladesh than with India. And so what we do is we set up a training course. Even though we're not the experts, but we would, we, you, you have to make sure that you train the people how to use the drug. You can't just give them a drug and tell them to use it. There has to be a training component in it as well. So this was a training uh, program that we ran uh, on how to use the ambisome. And these were some of the doctors that were being trained. They all work at the equivalent of a um, primary health care center. This is Dinesh Mundell, who really organized it and has really been a, a force in, in, in Bangladesh. I don't know if I have another picture of him. Uh, so this is a training session. So you see he, people here. That the drug comes in these ampules here, which is uh, powdered form. It has to be redissolved at a certain level and concentration. You can't just, um, you have to take the weight into account of the person, and you have to know how much drug you're administering, and you have to administer it properly. So it, uh, it's not difficult, but it has to be done correctly. So you have to have a, a, an important training component. So WHO, TDR, this was an important component of that. Uh, program to bring this drug uh, into Bangladesh. And, and WHO, we don't have the, we didn't have the experts. We're not experts in, in how to use the drug, but we do know who the experts are. And the expert here is Sham Sundar. People from India, of course, know him. He's probably done more in dealing with visceral lesh. He's probably treated more visceral leishmaniasis people than anybody in the world. He's developed, or well, he's the one who's really uh, shown that this drug could be useful. So whenever we have a training program, we always try to make sure Shams is there because he's the world expert. So we make sure the world expert is there in how to carry out the training. And this was the first patient in Bangladesh to be treated with a single dose ambisome. And you can see uh, these are people here being shown how to do it. Bangladesh took it on wonderfully. And they, they really have done a fantastic job in, in using single dose ambisome. Let's see what my next slide is. And, um, and then I should point out, so, so Bangladesh took it over, they used it, it was used very successfully. After it was shown to be a very successful program in Bangladesh, then India took it on. They, wouldn't, they weren't ready to take it on first, but after it was shown to be effective in Bangladesh, then India. And now India is, 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 is using it, it has their first line drug as well. So that's, that's fine, that's the treatment. So, but you're still left with this problem that I brought up earlier. You have 90 million people. How do you make sure that those people who have fever and disease go and get the treatment? What, how do you do this? Because it, the sooner you treat someone, the sooner you reduce the reservoir. So this is the real problem. So one, one, one possibility is you go inside the villages. This is, this is Dr. Das from the RMRI. You can go into a village. You, tell, you put down a mat and you say, if, if anybody here has fever, come and lie down on the mat. So he can check his uh, palpitate here and see if he has an enlarged spleen. If he's got fever and enlarged spleen, you do an RK39 test. And if he's positive, you can treat him. But this works very well. But it's still not practical because you have thousands of villages uh, in each district. And you have 20 districts in Bihar. And you still have this problem of 90 million people. And you can't go around doing this for, on that kind of scale. So this isn't going to work, even though you can do it. There just isn't the manpower to do it. This is, this is a non-starter, um, even though it looks simple enough. So one thing, uh, oh yeah, so then this is, the, uh, this is the area here that I'm showing is that, uh, you know, these are the different districts. And it, this, the Ganges runs here. So it's actually north of the Ganges where you have uh, virtually most of the cases. And, that, uh, it, and, and this is the area which are largely gets a lot of the flooding and larger the... Um, the monsoons gets, gets, gets really hits this area hard. But even if you cut this in half and you say there's 50 or 60 million people, the problem is, is, is the one of scale. So one thing we, we started doing, uh, another wonderful program is in India is that 
Each village has now an ASHA. So that's a woman who looks after the maternal health within the village. So these, these are women that if somebody's pregnant, they make sure that the person is taken care of and they make sure that the person gives birth at the primary health care center and not at the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the villages. So one thing we've started to do is to work with these, these women here, the ASHAs, and each ASHA is responsible for about 1,000 people. So if, if an ASHA knows what's going on in within that 1,000 people, she can be a resource to potentially identify fever cases. So we've set up uh, training programs. Uh, and fortunately, every month there's what's called ASHA days. And that's where all of the ASHAs from all of the villages gather in one place. And then they have a meeting to discuss what's going on over the last month within their villages and learn any new things. So, so this is Dr. Das again, and this is a training program where we set up uh, PowerPoint presentations and the ASHA sit in and we describe to them what the disease is and what to do if you think somebody has leishmaniasis or visceral leishmaniasis. This was taken last, um, last January, and you can see here, this is a, a room full of ashes, and this is in the area, oh, I pressed the wrong button. This is in this area here, Saharasha. This is where most of the cases are now. This is, this is an area where you have now most cases of visceral So we sent in some people there to start to train ashes in this area as well. Uh, so you can see, if you can train these people and they're together, each one of these represents a thousand people. So now you're amplifying your way to get into these areas. You're amplifying your, your, your way to, to, to bring knowledge into these areas. Uh, and we also provide each ASHA with a poster. So this is a poster that they put in a prominent place within the village. It describes what the disease is, how it's transmitted, uh, how it could be identified. It describes to them what the RK39 test is so that they know that they need to be tested. There's drugs available. And it says here that you shouldn't pay for treatment. The treatment is free. Don't pay for treatment. Go and get treated at the primary health care center. So these are, are also being put into thousands of these uh, villages as well. And it's not enough to just train ashes and say, okay, now we've done the job. You actually have to work, see if it's working. It's, if, 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 if by tr this training program, is, if it's making any difference. And so we, we did an analysis to see how many people were being referred by ashes to the PHCs for treatment before the training and it was at about 10%. So only one out of 10 people were being referred by ASHAs before training. And after training, in those areas where we provide training, about half of the people now are being referred by ASHAs. So we're starting to have a much better way of moving people uh, into these areas, into the PHCs. And the training is, is working. And this is now being taken on as a standard government program in India to train ASHAs to identify, and it's sort of broadly moved to not only visceral leishmaniasis, but fever cases in general, where fever is, is, is a major, uh, a major uh, identified as associated with disease in these villages. Um, so uh, so over, the, over the last five years now and less, a lot of the efforts now have moved away from here and they're now here. There's primary health care centers that give drugs either, well, previously was, was meltafosin, the oral drug. A lot of them are now moving to ambisome. Um, and the program in the villages as well, trying to br have knowledge in the villages so people know what to do when they have this disease and to try and move things in this area here so that the drugs, the diagnostics, the knowledge is all coming closer to the village. So we, Philip showed you that graph where it was going up and down. So where it, was, it went down, it was high, then it went down, then it went high again, now it's down again. Some people are saying, well, it's going to go back up. It's a cyclical thing. I don't think so. I think it's going to stay down because there's no time where, where we've had such good drugs available, such good diagnostics available, and so many people are being treated now. So I would be very surprised to see that curve go back up again. But we have to wait and see. Um, how things develop. Um, I'd just like to point out in, in, in Nepal, so this was the area in Nepal where all of the cases were, and this is which borders 
um, India here to Bihar. And this has now reached the elimination of 1 in 10,000. But something very interesting has occurred here is as this area has reached the elimination target of 1 in 10,000, even less than 1 in 10,000, there's been sporadic cases starting to pop up in other parts of Nepal, in, in this area, this area, this area, and here, where there was never cases before. And it's really hard to explain that. It's almost as though if you, if you shut the disease down in one area, it's almost like it's trying to survive and pop up in other areas. So it'll be interesting to see really what's going on in these areas, and we're trying to establish some programs now to, to follow up more carefully and try and find out how the disease got here and what the likelihood of these areas to grow is. So these are, these are concerns that you have to be always ready for when you, when you work on this, this kind of program. Um, I'll just talk a little bit um, about uh, reservoirs and, and, and it, w ha as you're starting to remove the disease and reach the elimination prog program, you really want to start targeting the reservoirs as well as you can. One of the things is we're not sure what the reservoir is. We know that visceral leishmaniasis is a reservoir, but we don't know if these asymptomatic people can transmit the disease. Uh, so that's one question. What role does asymptomatic play in transmission of the disease? And the other question that Philip brought up, of course, is the PKDL, and this is a macular form of PKDL here, um, is do these people transmit the disease? There is some reports that the papular and macular, uh, papular and nodular form transmit the disease, but this is the macular form, and it's really not known if it transmits the, the disease. So one of the things we've, we've been involved with is to try and answer that question in the following way. Um, we work in, this, in these villages which have the highest number of cases. So this is a village called Tarawa, and this was taken two years ago. Uh, there were 50 people in this village that had visceral leishmaniasis. So really a, a real focus of disease was in this village. And just in this area here, there were six cases. So we consider this ground zero. There's more cases of visceral leishmaniasis here than anywhere else in the world. Um, so we started to work into these villages and to see how the disease is spreading and which households it's spreading and where the disease is, is, is coming from uh, in these villages. And the kind of questions we're asking. So, so what we do is we go into the village and we test everybody with RK39. So everybody is given a blood test. We, 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 and then we group everybody according to families, uh, and we do that every six months. So we go in and, and start to follow serologically who becomes positive uh, over time and where the positive cases are coming from. Uh, this, is, this was taken last summer. This is me using a magnifying glass in these RK30. My eyes aren't as good as they used to be, so I have to use the magnifying glass to see the positive and negative. Uh, but this is typical of, of, of the way these studies are done. Uh, and then we draw maps, or we try to get an, an idea of, 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 of maps where the disease is. And in sort of this part of the village, uh, red means there's visceral leishmaniasis cases. So this is an area of visceral leishmaniasis cases. This part of the village, green, there were people with asymptomatic infection. So they, they were RK39 positive, but everybody was healthy here. And then we had some parts of the village which were uh, negative. There, were, there was no, uh, no cases. Uh, and then we had some which were PKDL. And we're not really interested in the cases. What we're most interested in is the family members. So this is where we're following. We're, we're looking at the people who live with the VL cases, people who live with these asymptomatic cases, to try and understand what's happening to the family members. Are they becoming positive? Are they getting the disease? So that's how you're looking at the transmission, not at the cases, but at the people that, the case, that live with the cases. Uh, so, and this is a typical camp that we set up when we're running these uh, RK39 tests. This is that poster that I was telling you about. This is present in, in, in all of the villages that we're working and in many others as well. Um, this is Dr. Pandey, who is the project manager uh, of the project. and. Uh, He's also a medical doctor, of course, so whenever, whenever he's in the villages, he also d runs a, a sort of a general clinic as well, so people can go to him and ask for medical help if they have anything unrelated to visceral leishmaniasis. 
So he usually goes in with his box here of, of drugs and he has things for fever, uh, things for helmet infections, iron for women, just basic things. And if he thinks somebody really needs more, then he'll refer them uh, to a hospital. So he runs a clinic at the same time that we do the RK39 blood testing in these villages. So I won't go through the data, but I'll just give you a sch schematic, which I think is, is quite interesting. Um, so this is, the, this is the baseline here. So this is where we first go into the village and we testing, we're testing family members here. We, it, we, the, the key is the family members that we're interested in. We're not interested in the cases so much, but it's the family members. And we do, this is just looking at RK39 positive. So if we look at visceral leishmaniasis, if somebody has visceral leishmaniasis, then around them, the people living around them, we have a lot of RK39 positive, an odds ratio of over five. So here you have a lot of RK39 positive. Um, if somebody is asymptomatically infected, so they're, they're healthy, they're RK39 positive, let's say there's one person in the house, and then we keep on following the family members, we didn't see a lot of other additional people here that are RK39 positive. PKDL, of course PKDL are RK39 positive, but we weren't seeing a lot of family members that were positive on RK39. And then of course we had controls here. And then we followed him for six months, three times, and we didn't see any increase in RK39 occurring as we're going from zero, six, 12, and 18 months. So what this indicates, and, and this was, initially it was a bit surprising because we're not seeing any increased transmission here in the VL houses, okay? And we thought, so we had to think, well, why is that? So why would you think that is? It's, it's actually a pretty simple answer. Uh, well, that's not, that's not the obvious one. N not season. These people were all treated, okay? So at baseline, this was close to the time they had the disease. They were all treated, okay? So the parasite level goes down, and now they're not transmitting the disease anymore. So this is an, an indication, obviously, that the treatment is important for reducing transmission. But we weren't seeing any real transmission occurring in, in those other houses. So, so based on this, we've, we, we're starting now to focus just in this area, okay, this red area in the VL houses. As soon as somebody gets VL, we go in and see what we can find in those houses. So we're now starting to narrow. We're not studying here anymore. We're moving in here to look at transmission that's occurring in these VL houses. And, and that's also quite interesting what we found. So if you take a VL index house here, so we have 89 VL cases here, uh, and we're screening family members. So this is family members that we're screening in the VL houses. And then we screen again in six months' time, and we're seeing what's happening in these houses. So as soon as there's VL, we go in and do screening. And then we're also looking at surrounding houses to the VL. And we're also looking at, in the same village, houses which are far away where there's no cases. So we're looking at houses, their neighbors, and houses which are far away. Um, and then we're, we're screening family members in, in these areas as well. Um, and in the VL house, uh, we identified 30 RK39 positive and nine new VL cases over the, over the next six months. Um, in the houses that were surrounding the VL house, we had, again, 38 asymptomatic cases and nine new uh, cases of visceral leishmaniasis. And in the control, these are houses which are far away. We're not seeing much happening in those houses. So the way, the way we can see this, and this is, this is ongoing, we still have to do larger numbers, but the way it's, sh it's shaping out is that this one here is a VL index case. So this is this red here. And so this is a VL index case, and these are houses around it, uh, and then houses around it are more susceptible to getting VL, the houses around it, so you have here new cases of VL in the surrounding houses, and then you have new cases of asymptomatic in the surrounding houses. So it's like microepidemics occurring around the index case here, whereas if you go far away from the houses, we're not seeing a lot of transmission or new cases in this area. So what it means for the, transmission uh, for the transmission program is that 
a lot of effort doesn't necessarily have to go into dealing with asymptomatic infections or even PKDL infections. The, the, the effort has to be able to go with the VL infections. And I think what this is telling us is that what we want to do is as soon as we have a VL case, we want to go in this area. And we want to test the people around them and identify uh, cases as soon as possible. So it's like going into that area where you have VL. And the other thing that we're trying to coordinate um, is with the uh, vector control people. So that wherever you have a case of visceral leishmaniasis, what, one thing you want to do here, if you have a case of visceral leishmaniasis, you want to get rid of the sand flies because the sand flies is the way it's going to start transmitting. So wherever you have a case of visceral leishmaniasis, you also move in here, do RK39, identify people, but also do a, a good spraying uh, to get rid of sand flies and reduce the sand fly in that area at the same time as, as, as finding the cases. Um, so, so that's basically the next step. Uh, up until this point, we've been doing things passively. When people, we try to make sure that people know about the disease, they come and they get treated. But we've not really attacked the disease. But if you can start to go into this and, do, and carry out this scenario, now you can start to really move in and start to attack the disease. And I think this could be uh, the next way of, of the next wave to try and bring down and control the disease. So in conclusion, the rapid diagnostic test and treatment has really been fantastic over the last 10 years. And as Philip showed you, it's really had a huge impact on bringing down the number of cases. Um, index screening, I think, is something that could be considered now as if you really want to go after the disease in a more focused way, index screening may be able to one way of doing that. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the challenge, of course, is going to be dealing with visceral leishmaniasis at the village level. You, you've really got to focus and think about how you're going to work uh, at the village level and, and go after uh, the, the disease at the village level. So I'll just finish with, with this slide here. This is the sort of, um, it took me a long time to figure this out and talk to a lot of people to figure out what is the flow of information to go from the government to the village. Because you have to, if, you, if, if you're going to implement these programs, you have to do it with the existing government programs. You can't necessarily leave it up to NGOs to go in there for a few years and then leave again. So this is, this is the flow of coming from the National Vector Borne Disease Control in, in uh, Delhi all the way down to the villages. And you can see at the bottom are the ashes, which are, we've worked with to train. But they're not able to really do that index screening that we're talking about. Uh, so the next level up from the ashes is basic health inspector. And a lot of these are present at the block level or else at the PHC level. So we're looking into some ways of trying to initiate a program to have these basic health inspectors to be able to help out with this index screening type of an approach. So this would be uh, one potential way to try and implement it. But if you want to implement, if you want to implement anything in a country, you have to understand these things because you have to know where things get done and, and who to deal with. So uh, trying to work at this level may be the best way to, uh, to move forward. So I'd just like to thank, or just point out some of the people uh, that have been involved with the work at the WHO uh, here that have been uh, people in India, Sham Sundar, Pradeep Das, Dr. Pandey, really these three people do an amazing work in India. In Nepal, Suman Rijal uh, has really been very important and, and others as well. Dinesh Mandel in Bangladesh, who has really, I think, single-handedly almost eliminated the disease himself. He's done you know, great work in Bangladesh. And I, I, I didn't talk about the work. Actually, I'll talk about the work uh, that we did in Sri Lanka with, uh, in my next talk with Sri Linda. And Peter, Peter here has, has also been involved with that work as well. So I'll, that'll be on my next talk. So, so with that, I'll stop and, and um, be happy to try and answer any questions. <coughs>